Welcome back, everybody, to another edition of The Hobby Musician. On today's episode, I'm going to take us through the top three things that I really look at whenever I'm deciding to make a new instrument purchase, um, especially if the instrument or the piece of gear that I'm looking at is not necessarily a brand name thing. Uh, we've talked in previous episodes that a lot of times as a hobby musician, you might be limited on some of the resources that you can put into a purchase. So you might have to look at some companies that aren't the big um, industry leading companies, but do you still get the same kind of quality and what are the things you can look for to make sure you do get that quality? Now also, at the end of the video, I'm going to tell you guys one of the things that I don't really consider when I'm buying a, um, an instrument, and I think that's going to be a little controversial. So if you're interested, uh, keep watching and we'll get to that a little later. Now for me, the primary factor that makes an instrument a good purchase or not a good purchase, again personally, is playability. Does the instrument lend itself to easy playing? Can I move my hand around the neck? Can I get to the controls easy? Um, if I can, that's going to allow me to play better. I'm going to get inspired. I'm going to be able to perform um, at a higher level. And to me, that is more important than necessarily what sticker or what company's logo is on the headstock. So with that in mind, um, how do I determine what is playable and not playable? That's those three things that I mentioned at the top of the video. So I'm going to pull over uh, one of the bases that I have and I want to take you through the features and show you what I look for and then I'm going to tell you how much it costs me and you're going to be able to see that it's possible, absolutely possible to get some quality stuff for not a lot of money. So this is um, my kind of J style uh, base. It's um, just a basically, uh, basically pun intended, it's just a simple J style. So it has the J style pickups. It's a four string bass, um, has a maple neck. But you can see up here on the headstock, this is not a name brand. This is not a Fender. Uh, this is an SX um, kind of off brand uh, carbon copy, if you will. Now I got this particular bass uh, at a site, rondomusic.com. Now they're not sponsors, but um, as we're going to see in this video and probably more videos in the future, um, there are places out there, and Rondo's one of them, that you can find quality instruments that aren't name brand, but still really stack up. So the first thing that I look for when I'm determining playability is the relief in the neck. Um, and what that means is when you are looking at down the neck of an instrument, if you were to kind of take this bass and look down the strings, if you see that the neck bows in or bows out, that's what we call the relief of the neck. And all uh, instruments like this would have a rod, a truss rod running down the neck that will be able to be adjusted and you can tighten or loosen that truss rod and that will affect how much curvature is in the neck. Now you want some curvature in the neck because if you were to fret the high, um, the, or sorry, the notes that are way up high on the neck, if there's no curve in the neck, the string will get pushed down and it'll start buzzing on the frets. It'll start banging, physically banging into the frets down here on the instrument and that's going to make it unplayable. If you can't get the notes to come out of your bass, it doesn't matter how much you paid for it, um, it's unplayable. So being able to have an instrument that has the proper amount of neck relief is the first factor that I look for um, in playability. Now a very easy way to, to check the amount of relief is you can fret, you can take one finger and fret the very highest fret on the neck and another finger and fret the very lowest fret on the neck and if you look um, anywhere in the middle but especially kind of at the 12th fret or right around the middle of the neck if there's a little gap, a tiny little gap between the string and the frets uh, then you know you have kind of a bend or a curve in the neck. The second thing that I look for in terms of playability is I always check the fret edges of a guitar. So if I were to take the neck, if I were to take my first finger and thumb and go up and down the neck of a guitar, if I pinch just a little bit, I would start to feel as I go by the frets, if the fret edges are sticking out a little bit too much or if there's some rough edges, you can actually feel a scratching as you go by each fret. Now, you don't want that on a neck because, as I said before, if you're trying to play something uh, 
complicated or intricate or you have got to move really fast. Well, if the frets are scratchy and they stick out, as you move your hand by them, um, you could kind of get momentarily caught on them or it could distract you or kind of um, break your focus on whatever you're playing. Well, really high-end instruments are going to have somebody sitting there at the factory with a file and a, a polishing cloth and they're going to go through and one by one uh, make sure that all the frets are sanded down. But a lot of times a more affordable instrument, that's just not an option. But the good news is whether or not an instrument starts out with scratchy fret edges, you can definitely go back and file them down yourself. And it's a very easy thing to do. And as I said before, we're going to have uh, some upcoming videos that kind of take us through how to do that. The third thing that I look for as it relates to playability is the string height itself. Now this term is called the action of a guitar and how high or how low a string is set um, is absolutely a personal preference to whoever the player is. There's a lot of famous musicians who prefer to have really high strings or really low strings, but how high or low those strings are can absolutely affect how you play the instrument. And for me, I have a certain height that I like my strings. The good news again is whether or not the instrument comes this way, pretty much every instrument now in the modern era, if you look down at the bridge or wherever the strings are attached, you can see on this particular model, you've got little Allen screws that are set into these saddles and I can take the Allen wrench that came with this instrument and I can tighten or loosen those Allen screws and that will raise or lower the saddle, which in turn raises and lowers the entire string. And when this bass first came, I checked all three of those things. I looked at the relief in the neck and I made a couple minor adjustments. I checked all the fret edges and I took a little polishing stick and I kind of went through and there was a couple scratchy ones, but I got those filed down. And finally, I just played it for about an hour and in the playing, I would stop and I would make a little adjustment to the string height and keep playing it and then make another adjustment. And by the end of an hour, I had gotten this bass really playable and so playable in fact I mean it can cover any kind of styles you want it can handle just a basic kind of a simple groove like like this And um, if you throw on just a little subtle reverb and you want to do some intricate kind of chords or tapping kind of stuff, it can handle that too, just like this. Finally, if you want to go really crazy, you can throw on like a dripping, wet, modulated reverb and create some crazy kind of ambient tones, uh, kind of like this. So guys, you can see that a bass like this uh, can handle just about anything you need to throw at it, uh, just along with kind of those name brand basses. Well, I haven't yet told you what I paid for this. When I bought this bass, I paid $89. Now, if you guys are out there uh, familiar at all with kind of the lines of basses offered by companies like Fender and Gibson and things like that, you're probably just falling out of your seat. $89, that's, that's almost laughable. Now, 
I would say this bass is playable and quality, but I'm not trying to suggest by any means that I think this $89 bass is equivalent to one of those $1,000 basses. No, no, no. Uh, one thing I'll show you guys, if you look over here at the tuning pegs on this, uh, anybody out there knows anything about you know gear ratios like this, the exposed uh, gear tuners with these really wide gaps, the, the ratio, the turning ratio on this is not good at all. And once you get it in tune, you better not touch these um, or else you're gonna go way past or way below tuning. So there are definitely things about this bass that um, show that it's an $89 bass, but that's different than saying it's unplayable. I can use these tuning pegs. And as I said before, I can absolutely make all the settings and adjustments to this bass. And you heard the sound of this, it's fine. So you absolutely have options out there that can be quite affordable um, in, in, instead of being stuck with going for a more expensive option. Okay, well I promised everybody some controversy in this video, and so here it goes. Um, I said before of what I look for in a bass, and we kind of went through the three features that I check uh, whenever I get an instrument or go to think about buying one. Well, there's one feature that I don't check, pickups. And I know there are gonna be tons of people out there that just think that's total blasphemy. But I can tell you guys, I do not check or really care about pickups whenever I'm purchasing an instrument. And there's a couple reasons why. I think that too often we can get trapped in the discussion on, well, does it have the latest DiMarzio pickups or, or does it have the latest Seymour Duncan pickups or which version do you have and which is in the neck and which is in the bridge. And honestly, those are fun conversations to have, but when you're on a tight budget, we are living in a modern era where manufacturing processes and access to materials has come a long way since the 60s and the 70s and even the 80s. Instruments now that are made in factories all over the world are coming out with some really usable pickups already in them. And so striving to get that instrument that has the name brand pickup can sometimes add a lot of cost onto something that doesn't necessarily need to be there in the first place. So that's again, just a personal thing that I um, don't pay much attention to when I'm purchasing an instrument. Now, will I go back and maybe consider in the future swapping out a pickup? Maybe, but not often. Well guys, I hope you enjoyed that episode and if you have had experience where you've found a piece of gear or bought something that surprised you about how much quality you were getting for a little price, let me know down in the comments. And as always, until next time, play on my friends, play on.